everybody ready to talk about leadership? Yes. 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 So let's talk about leadership. So what does this mean um, for us, for veterinary nurses? Um, how can we as veterinary nurses formally progress um, our growth throughout our career? So there's things like promotions and professional growth. There's um, a bunch of different titles um, that we can have sort of moving up the ladder in our hospitals or shelters and places of work. Um, even up to, I know LVTs who um, have become directors and even at the ASPCA we have a few LVTs who have had the director role, which I think is really incredible and also shows how far we've come as veterinary nurses in this career. And um, there's also the veterinary technician specialist um, in all of these categories. So it has really expanded. Uh, you'll notice that shelter medicine is not up there, but that is something that is in the works and I'm super excited about that. And I encourage all of you guys to look into that um, shelter medicine certification when it becomes available. I think that's something that's really needed. We really need people like all of you who are so specialized in shelter medicine to be an advocate for our patients. So just a little bit about me um, and why I should maybe be talking to a group of people about leadership. Um, so like Alia said, um, I graduated um, from SUNY Delhi a very long time ago. And um, I did a short stint at Long Island Veterinary Specialists. Anyone from Long Island out there? Yes, there's at least one or two in every room. <laughs> and then I got a job at the Animal Medical Center in New York. Um, when I graduated, I had literally no idea that my future would be anesthesia. Um, in fact, like most other nurses, I was terrified of it, um, having little to no advanced education on anesthesia in school. Um, and when I applied at the Animal Medical Center, that was the only position that they had available. They're like, well, do you want to work in surgery? And I said, sure, okay. I kind of remember to put ISO on at 2.4%. That's the thing, right? Uh, that's basically the most I knew back then. Um, and then the more I got comfortable with anesthesia, the more I realized I really was into it and that it's more bright-brained and creative than I thought or that I had remembered from school. Um, I also started working in the emergency and critical care departments because I was always gravitating towards emergency. I love that, um, that adrenaline rush of treating emergencies. So I sort of bounced back and forth for a while. Um, and I eventually became team leader of anesthesia and I became the training for all of the incoming anesthetists. Um, I did some work with Dr. William Muir um, that was super exciting and I learned so much about the Massimo PVI monitor and fluid responsiveness. And um, I became the AV, uh, the, an LVT of the year at one year and that eventually drove me to get my certification in anesthesia and pain management. Mostly because the more I learned about pain management, the more I realized we could be doing so much more for our patients and that we as nurses need to be an advocate for these patients and a voice for these patients um, when no one else can be. And that when you go to a doctor asking to augment a pain management protocol or anesthetic protocol, the more that you know, the more knowledge that you have behind it, the more of a case you're gonna make for these patients. And that's where the power of knowledge and education really comes in. So then I started talking about stuff that I knew about. Um, I presented at IVAX and at NYSAFT. Um, I eventually published a book chapter on my favorite topic, analgesic pharmacology. Um, and then I started my own business, basically because so many surgery residents that left would end up then calling me saying, hey, do you mind coming to work at my new practice or just training them, teaching them how to do local blocks and epidurals? And um, I realized that there was this huge need for advanced anesthesia training at other hospitals because of the limited amount of anesthesia training that we currently get in school. And so this is something now I currently do um, also when I have time, um, when I'm not working at the ASPCA. Uh, but the ASPCA hired me to give them some lectures um, one day. And then a month later, I got a call that they wanted me to work there. <laughs> so I've been there. Uh, for two years ever since and it's a really great fit for me um, that I'm able to to train and to teach and to um, to do pain management consults on humane law patients um, I really couldn't be more grateful to work for uh, such an amazing organization um, enough about me <laughs> let's start thinking about what does leadership look like to you so who are the people in your career that you have 
looked up at and been like, man, I, I really want to get to that point. Like, what behaviors or traits do these people have that you admire so much and that you just think in a few years, if I could just get to that point? Um, in my early days at AMC, there was a critic list who, when I would be freaking out, an animal was crashing or on norepi and vasopressin CRI and all this stuff, and with its chest cracked open, and she would come in the room and in this calm and even tone, just say, how can I help? And I was floored by it. I'm like, how, wh why are you, why are she freaking out? <laughs> um, but she would just basically dictate the entire vibe in the room and make everything, make a CPR always the most organized. And I thought, okay, that's what I, that's my goal. I want to be that person who can step into this chaotic environment and be the most calmest person in the room. And those people are usually the most effective. And that's why I admired her so much. But does someone have to be in a position of management or authority to be a leader? No, right? So there's different types of authority. There's both informal and formal authority. And why would a team choose to grant authority to another person? Think about the people that you work with right now who aren't in a position of authority, but everyone gravitates to for answers. And for so many of you, that might be actually you. So a staff member could have a lot of formal or very little formal authority, but a lot of influence or informal authority. Basically what that is, is an agreement between parties. All these parties have agreed that yes, we are going to listen to what this person has to say because we trust them. There's a lot of definitions about leadership, but this one resonates with me the most. Is that leadership is about holding space for learning and growth to happen and ultimately managing the inevitable losses that come with change. So there are four needs of followers. Um, you're in a position of authority or leadership, now what? These are the things that our people need from us as leaders. So we're gonna go through some, so trust. Um, trust is primarily built through relationships, right? That's not rocket science. Um, you can't have trust without first forming a relationship or a bond with your employee. When I have a new direct report now, I sit down with them and I ask them, how do you like to receive feedback? Um, what do you do when you lose your center at work? Basically, it's a working styles um, questionnaire that will help me be the best manager for that person um, and to be able to support them as much as they need. Um, seeing leaders do what they say they do, follow through is super important. It's really easy to maybe yes someone to death. Yeah, totally, I'm gonna do that. Uh, but if you don't, over time, that's gonna help you lose trust with your employee. And behavioral predictability. So this is really important in times of change. Um, you know, during a stressful time, would you rather have someone who um, is really emotionally stable and like holds their ground or someone who has, you know, thrown Dopplers across their room and thrown up their hands and walked out the building? So behavioral predictability, right? To be even keeled. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So stability. So being emotionally neutral. But there are challenges in veterinary medicine about being emotionally neutral, especially in shelter medicine, right? So within our field, there's a lot of opportunity for varied emotions. So we have anesthetic arrests, euthanasias, um, maybe volatile clients or really upset clients. Um, it's really important as a leader to keep your emotions in check in front of the people that rely on you the most for leadership, um, especially during upsetting times. Um, so lack of judgment. So if someone comes to you with a um, interpersonal issue, what they need from you is someone who's not gonna pass judgment on that other person. You know, maybe the, the part of us that just wants to kind of get in good with that employee wants to say, oh my God, yeah, I know, isn't she just so annoying? Uh, but that is gonna tell that employee that they might be saying that about you when someone else goes to complain about them. So even if you feel the same, whatever emotions are coming up, you need to stay, um, you need to stay with a lack of judgment for those types of interpersonal issues. And then predictability, like I said, we need a leader who is going to, we're not gonna be surprised by how they respond to something. And then hope. So hope gives followers inspiration for improvements for the future. It gives reason, a, uh, it gives people a reason to commit. 
which can be really important um, when we have so many nurses and, and staff who are burnt out. It suggests that the future will be better than the present and um, will help with a positive attitude. Times of change can be very difficult for everyone. It's super important as a leader to stay hopeful and optimistic. And compassion. If people feel like they do not have a supervisor leader who really truly cares about them individually, they are not going to be committed and, or engaged in their work. Um, it's as simple as that. Having those tough conversations with people, um, even about performance in an effort to have them grow and pulling them aside um, when they're visibly upset in the moment, these are all actions that show employees that you actually care about them as a person. And these opportunities should not be missed. You should take, no matter how busy you are, you should take these opportunities to be a, a human being uh, to your direct reports. So it's um, interesting to think about which of these needs are the easiest for you and which are the hardest. Um, it's really important to know where we excel and where we need a little work. And that will um, lead us into practices for effective leadership. Um, so we're going to talk about self-awareness managing your energy, responding, not reacting, giving feedback, and coaching, not controlling. So self-awareness. Um, this is critical to be aware of who you are and how you impact others. Do you guys see what I did there? It's a cat looking in the mirror, self-aware. <laughs> Uh, this requires regular reflection, so um, <laughs> this is something that we need to do all the time. So practices like pay close attention to how people react to your words and behaviors. We have a lot more influence than we think that we do. And ask for and listen to feedback. I can't stress this enough. Ask for feedback all the time. If you just gave a two-hour presentation or if you just gave um, if you just talk to someone for five minutes, ask someone who is around or someone that you trust for both appreciative and developmental feedback. There's no way that we can grow professionally unless we know what we're excelling to continue to do that or what we need to develop. So that's where we can concentrate and work on. And identify your conflict style. So 1974, yeah, those kittens are fighting. <laughs> Uh, so in 1974, there was the Thomas um, Kelman Conflict Mode Instrument. So um, if you just search that, you can find this website if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, basically what it is, is there are 30 pairs of statements, and the respondents chose the statement that they most identified with. And this is super popular. There was over 5 million copies sold, um, and it's the most widely used inventory tool of conflict styles. So what they came up with um, were these different modes. So there's the competing mode collaborating, compromising, avoiding, and accommodating. And all of us have some combination of these modes within us. So the competing mode it focuses on results and not relationships. And this is a power-oriented mode. So think about maybe some of the people you know who maybe this is their conflict style. The accommodating mode is relationship focused, not results oriented. So this is sort of the opposite. This is neglecting your own concerns to satisfy the needs of others. And this really doesn't get us anywhere, right? Um, the key is to be both people and, and results oriented. And compromising mode does that a little bit. This is moderate in both relationships and results. Um, it's finding a solution that partially satisfi satisfies both parties, but doesn't quite get you there. And the avoiding mode is neither relationships or results oriented. These are people who see conflict and they run the other way, um, which it honestly is not that uncommon in, in a lot of our hospital environments. Um, it's postponing an issue, withdrawing from a threatening situation just because it's easier. And the collaborating mode is both results and relationship focused. So this is digging into an issue to pinpoint the underlying needs of both the individuals. So there are some situations where some of these modes would be more helpful or more hurtful. And we all embody one or more of these conflict styles, usually one or two of them more than the other. Um, but it's, what it comes down to is that we, both, we need to be both people and results oriented when it comes to conflict. 
And like I said, if you want to learn more about this or identify your conflict style, if you just um, do a Google search for that, you can fill out that questionnaire. Managing your energy. So leadership means having an endless to-do list, multiple responsibilities, dealing with varying emotions due to our very sensitive nature of work. So our energy level and mood have way more impact on those around you than you might think. Energy is super contagious. So do you ever notice about, uh, notice how the vibe of a room is usually dictated by the most senior person in the room or with the person with the most informal authority? So for example, a angry surgeon will then have a cranky anesthetist and then have a super sad or irritable assistant and so on and so forth. <laughs> Sound like surgery, right? <laughs> um, that's how energy moves and it goes both up and down the ladder like that. So how do we manage our energy? So what are, what are the practices that we can do? First, try your best to never bring bad energy to work, no matter what you have going on in your life. When you walk through that door, really be there to, to do your job. It's not hard for, for us to be mission driven, right, in what we do. Um, we're all that here because we love animals and we want to do what's best for them. So it's important to try to get that in your head before you walk through the door um, to, to best manage your energy and to sort of look at the big picture. Check your energy before you walk in the room. Um, you know, did you just come from a stressful meeting or an argument with your friend? You want to try to recenter yourself. Know what activities at work give you energy and what depletes it. So try to think about that for a minute. What things do you get super passionate about and you feel like you could do this all day? And what things you're like, oh my God, I cannot work in ICU another day or just something like that. Uh, for me, it's super easy. I really get energy from teaching anesthesia and troubleshooting things. Um, but if I'm at my computer for more than an hour, I feel like I need to take a nap. So I, I know that if I'll, I'll set a timer on how long I can actually sit at my computer and then do a hospital floor, uh, a, a, a round around the hospital floor. So I really encourage you guys to all figure that out through your day, how you can manage your energy the best. Um, develop daily personal habits. So there's a lot of things that we can do, and we hear about this all the time, right? Like meditate and, you know, be well and drink the most water. Like, yes, we all know we're supposed to be doing these things, but that's really easier said than done. Uh, for the past two and a half years, I've been doing transcendental meditation, and I really have to say it totally changed my life. Um, there's days that are so busy that I cannot take a lunch break. But no matter what, I find time to do my um, afternoon 20-minute meditation, and it completely revitalizes me. I feel like I couldn't live without it. So yeah, we all talk about wellness, you know, but it, it really is true. <laughs> like these things can actually really help you get through your day. So responding, not reacting. So reacting is quick, it's totally unconscious, and it's emotional. And it's usually driven by our ego. Um, it's passionate and defensive. But reacting does not make things better and often undermines compassion, stability, and trust, these things that our followers need from us. Responding is slower and more conscious and gives us the opportunity to intentionally select what you want to say or do. I know that's kind of easier said than done, but we want to pause and consider what was just said to us um, and formulate a response that might preserve your relationship. So how do we do this? How do we respond instead of react? So someone says something inflammatory. Check your emotional reaction initially. Um, we experience this right away in the body, like does your heart start pacing or does your stomach get super tight? Um, take a breath through the nose and exhale longer. Uh, it's a vagal response actually <laughs> to slow your heart rate. It may seem like it's too late to take the time to breathe but honestly, it's better to take this pause than to respond um, and say something unfavorable. Consider the content of what you just heard. Um, what might an appropriate response be? Make sure you completely understand the content of what was said by saying, so what I'm hearing you say is, and repeating that um, might help bring clarity to what this person wanted to get through to you. It could have been just been a misunderstanding. So repeating that, not only helps clarify it,
but also gives you more time to think about what an appropriate response would be. So acknowledge what you heard and respond to the extent that you're able. If you feel like this was so inflammatory you can't even wrap your brain around what this person just said, it's fine to visit the conversation later. You can just say, you know what, I think that this is something we should revisit in a couple of hours. There's nothing wrong with that. And that can literally be the difference between preserving your relationship with that person. So giving feedback. So the only thing that really changes behavior is feedback of one kind or another. And it should go in every direction up the ladder. So radical candor. So this is being able to challenge directly and show that you care personally at the same time. Has anyone here ever heard this concept about radical candor? Yeah? Yes, Kimberly, I know you have. <laughs> okay. So there's, um, based on this concept, there's four different ways to respond. There's ruminous empathy, and this is praise that isn't specific enough to help the person understand what was good, or criticism that is sugar-coated and unclear. Then there's manipulative insincerity, and this is praise that is either not specific or insincere, or criticism that is neither clear nor kind. There's obnoxious aggression, so this is praise that doesn't feel sincere, or criticism that is not delivered kindly. And then radical candor is praise that is specific and sincere, or criticism that is clear and kind. So we should always try to live in that area of radical candor. <clears throat> And this is a book that was written by Kim Scott. And this little diagram helps explain maybe um, what these might sound like. But when you don't care personally or only challenge directly, your praise or criticism will not achieve the intended results. And instead, we'll land in one of the three other quadrants made up by the um, care personally and challenge directly access. And if you guys want to learn more about this concept, this is a book by Kim Scott that I highly recommend to you reading. OK, so more about feedback. So has anyone ever heard of the situation behavior impact model of communicating? Not a lot of people. Great. So this is a simple way to structure feedback and ensure that what you're saying focuses on <clears throat> behavior and not on that specific person. It's what the person is doing and not who the person is. So before giving feedback, use this table either literally or in your head to structure and test for the usefulness of your feedback. So we're going to give you an example of what this might look for me at work. Hello there, Alessandra. Remember the other day when I was performing anesthesia on a patient? That's the situation. You came in and asked me to hurry after the patient was recovered because you needed me to cover your lunch and walked away. Behavior. That made me feel stressed and that I wouldn't have the time to adequately monitor my patient who was critical and you didn't, have, you didn't give me an opportunity to respond. So that's the impact. And that's a developmental way to express the SBI model, but we can also do that in appreciative ways. Does that make sense to everyone? This is praise that is, or a, this is feedback that is very specific to a person's behavior and not who they are. So in order to be effective and productive, feedback must always be specific. So you want to name the behavior and then name the impact. As close proximity to the behavior as possible. It's really hard to talk to someone about something they did a month ago. Um, they might not recall it, or it just seems really obscure and out of the blue. So if you witness feedback, or, you, or I'm sorry, if you witness a behavior that you would like to adjust, or if someone tells you about a behavior, do whatever you can to talk to that person as soon as possible so you can sort of nip it in the bud. It needs to be direct. Don't try to dance around or dilute the behavior. This might, try, this might make us more comfortable um, for people who are more fearful of conflict, but to the other person, it just makes them lack confidence. So you need to go into these conversations by just having the confidence that what you want to talk to them about is in their highest good. It needs to be kind with attention to how the recipient, um, recipient might be feeling. And based on behavior, if you focus on personality, it will most always be received defensively. Don't say things like, why are you so mean all the time? Like that. I, if someone said that to me, I'd say, I mean all the time, all the time. You know, you can't 
just say that, a blanket statement like that to someone. And geared for growth, so make sure the feedback speaks to doing a better job and having a better outcome. So this SBI model continued for Alessandra. So for the next time, if you see that I'm performing anesthesia on a patient, please give me a moment to respond so we can come up with a plan that works for both of us then the patients. And then we hug. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so coaching, not controlling. So what's coaching? So coaching builds trust and compassion. It generates a deeper dictated learning. And it's more likely to lead to that, be that lasting behavioral change, whereas controlling diminishes trust and compassion. It gets only in the moment results. So what that means is, if you try to control what someone is really doing, it means that when you're around, they're going to be like, oh, OK, I need to act this way now. <laughs> but then when you're not around, they're going to do whatever they want to do. So that's where coaching comes in. So some helpful phrases. Um, so these are all good for communication and for coaching. Uh, when you're trying to change someone's behavior that is impacting others, coaching is super essential. You can't just tell someone to stop acting a way that they could have been acting their entire life, that this is a, a behavior of theirs that no one has ever tried to change. Your approach to the behavior will basically set the stage for your future relationship with this person and how the conversations are going to go. So these are all helpful phrases that can help increase that communication between you and your employee. So we've gone over a lot of material. I feel like it can be a lot to take in. Um, leading simply comes down to modeling and connecting and involving. And this is your basic framework for leadership and communication. This creates a special team of people that performs important and meaningful work that works together to make things better. So we want to model for us the behavior that we want to see. If we want people to stop being late every day, we cannot be late every day ourselves. We want to connect with the people that we lead on a real human level. We want to involve them as much as possible. Whenever at work I'm putting out a new SOP or revisiting something in the hospital that I know is going to affect the, employee, the staff more than it's actually affecting me as a manager, there's never a time where I don't consult with them, where I come down and say, hey guys, I'm working on this new recovery SOP. What do you think about this? And then I get the feedback from them because it's going to affect them the most. And this also, for these individuals, it shows them that you care about their opinion. And then when this SOP comes out and something that they suggested comes in it, they're going to feel proud of that. And so it's really important to involve everyone that you work with. So for modeling, be what it is you want to see more of and do what it is you want everyone else to do. We lead by example all the time. And that's not just people who are in a formal position of authority. It's also people who are in an informal position of authority. So for connecting, have more meaningful conversations. Show people the big picture more often, because I know for, for so many that can be really lost when we focus on really specific things that employees might get upset about, um, like tardiness or, or call outs. It's really important to let them see the big picture of, of what we're all working towards here and the reason why we need people to be dependable, dependable so we can take care of the patients that we know we're going to have. Um, you want to let them know that you have their back and appreciate them with feedback. Um, for something that's going on in the ASPCA hospital, part of our management goals, that everyone in management um, is going to give two pieces of appreciative feedback a day to any staff member. And this is something that we want to do because we want to be able to communicate with our staff more and just to be able to appreciate them more, make them feel more appreciated. Because sometimes even though we do have these feelings, we just don't say it. But the more that you give that appreciative feedback, it's really incredible to watch. It, it becomes this chain reaction where you'll give a piece of appreciative feedback and then you'll see that person give someone else a piece of appreciative feedback. So it really is contagious. You want to ask more questions and listen more. I know that's really tough. It can be tough for me. It's tough for everyone. But just try to, when you're having these conversations, just be committed to not talking and listening to what that other person is. Really listen to what that other person is telling you. 
Involve the team the way that you would want to be involved. Try and ask their opinion on areas that you're aiming to improve in the department, like we talked about. And again, at the ASPCA, um, we have what's called the big three for management. So this, so this is what we go by as managers. We want to set up our team members for um, success by setting clear expectations. We want to give regular, effective feedback, both appreciative and developmental. We want to provide opportunities for learning and development. And this has worked out really well for us. All right, thank you, everyone.